in the previous lecture videos i have explained what is the basis of foreign trade and one of the basis could be differences in relative prices across countries but this was not the understanding hundreds of years back the first theory that we have of international trade is called mercantilism and mercantilism was advocated essentially by merchants in europe and this kind of a thinking prevailed between 16th to about 18th century and and it was written by different merchants and one of them being thomas munn he was a british merchant and he wrote a book called england's treasure by foreign trade this was written around 1620 and was published around 1665 their basic argument in mercantilism is that you can become better off by making someone worse off for example if i want to become rich i can only do so by exploiting others so this was the general thinking of mercantilism this argument that you can become better off by making others worse off was also extended to foreign trade now according to mercantilist wealth of a nation is the amount of gold and silver a country has the more wealth it has the stronger armies it can support and so on now in terms of foreign trade look at the following around that time when a country exported goods it received payments in terms of gold and silver and when a country imported goods it paid in terms of gold and silver so if you want to maximize the amount of wealth that is the accumulation or holding of gold and silver what you will do is you'll try to maximize exports and minimize imports in today's world it is hard to understand how this would work but consider the following <clears throat> what you are trying to do is you want other countries to buy your goods but you but uh, you do not want to buy anything from other countries now in a democratic world this is not going to happen when we treat different countries with respect so the only way this could work is if these countries like the european nations could go out and conquer rest of the world and force their thinking about foreign trade on rest of the world or the colonies so in between 16 to 18th century you see that phenomena of colonization by different european powers and how was this justified europe wanted to become richer and the way to do it at least through foreign trade was to force uh, these colonies to buy your products and you do not buy anything from those countries so this is called the mercantilist explanation or theory of foreign trade so according to mercantilist foreign trade is a zero sum game and that is you can only gain when you make others worse off so there's a positive side and you become richer only by making others poorer so foreign trade is a zero sum game thus colonization as well as slavery could easily be justified through this theory called mercantilism and essentially there what we believe is if we have the power we should exploit others and that's how we'll become richer or wealthier and this prevailed between 16 to 18th century but around the middle of 18th century this kind of thinking was challenged by different thinkers and these thinkers emphasized equality liberty and justice to all and if we treat human beings equally then this we will not use this theory called mercantilism and if you look at the historical episodes of american and the french revolutions what is the american revolution all about if you read the us constitution you find it emphasizes equality liberty and justice for all treat everyone equally 
the French Revolution was against the French king. And, and so it was an uprising by common people and they just wanted to emphasize equality, liberty and justice to all. In terms of economics, a major challenge to mercantilism came from a Scottish gentleman called Adam Smith, who wrote his masterpiece called An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of Wealth of Nations in around 1776. According to Adam Smith, a wealth of a nation should never be measured in terms of gold and silver, but in terms of how much a country can produce or what is the productive capability of a country. And once he changed the definition of wealth of nations, he was able to show that free foreign trade is a positive sum game where all countries can gain by participation in foreign trade. And in a formal way, he was the first one to emphasize the role of differences in prices being the basis for foreign trade. So that way, Adam Smith is considered to be the father of modern economics, and his contribution was a major one in terms of free markets and free foreign trade. And once again, this is what he showed, that free foreign trade can be a positive sum game for all countries involved. Adam Smith is considered to be a classical economist. So what we'll do next is we will look at two models based on classical thinking and the first one to contribute as far as classical models goes is Adam Smith and the second person is David Ricardo. So here what I'm doing is I'm listing the assumptions which we can use for Smith's model as well as for David Ricardo's model. These people assumed that labor is the only factor of production. The second assumption they made, apart from everything else, is production exhibits constant cost. For example, if you require eight hours of labor time to produce one yard of cloth, then 80 hours of labor time is required to produce 10 yards of cloth. Or in other words, in terms of our language, what we will have is a constant cost PPC. And you have already seen how we explain trade using constant cost PPC and what are the consequences of that. The third assumption they made is labor cannot migrate from one country to another. And this makes sense, otherwise the PPC will be affected. And the fourth assumption they made is exports must pay for imports. By now, all of us know that the basis for foreign trade is for most part, differences in autarky prices. And most of the economists believe that differences in relative prices is essentially due to differences in cost of producing these goods. And, and when we have perfect competition, this is something you may recall when we made assumptions about perfect competition, is that price will be forced to equal marginal cost of producing it. And once again, what is marginal cost is the cost of producing an additional unit of output. Now, if you want price of a product to be lower, in such a case, marginal cost of production has to be lower. And if you want price of a product to be higher, then the marginal cost of production must be higher. Now, we are examining classical models where they had assumed one factor of production and they had assumed labor is the only thing required to produce a particular output. Now, we are looking at two goods, clothing and food. So what will be marginal cost of clothing? It will simply be W, which stands for wages times ALC and ALC is the amount of labor time required to produce one unit of clothing. For example, I require 10 hours of labor time to produce one unit of clothing and my hourly wage is $5.
So how much is the cost of producing one unit of clothing? It will be five times 10 and that will be $50. And in a similar way, we know marginal cost of food will be W times ALF, where W is still wage rate and ALF is the amount of labor time required to produce one unit of food. Now, based on this, we know marginal cost of, say, producing clothing can be lower if and only if wages are lower or and the amount of labor time required to produce one unit of clothing is lower. That's how we can get the marginal cost of clothing to be lower. Thus, we know marginal cost will be lower if and only if wages are lower or and the amount of labor time required to produce that particular output is lower. And so if you want prices to be lower, they can be lower if and only if wages are lower or and the amount of labor time required to produce one unit of output is lower. And this is when we are looking at only one factor of production called labor. And once again, we know under perfect competition, price equals marginal cost of production of clothing and price also equals marginal cost of production of food. And now let us divide PC by PF. So you divide PC by PF, wages will cancel out and what you are left with is ALC by ALF or the amount of labor time required to produce one unit of clothing divided by amount of labor time required to produce one unit of food. So when you are looking at relative prices, look, the wages have disappeared. The only thing we have is the amount of labor time required, and that is all. So when we are looking at or using a general equilibrium analysis, and we have only one factor of production, input prices do not matter. But if we have more than one factor of production or a two or more, in that case, input prices will matter. So keep this in mind. When we are looking at one factor of production, input price like wage does not matter. And prices of these commodities essentially depend upon the ratio of labor time required to produce one good relative to other. Just to reiterate, we know when we are looking at one factor of production, that is labor, which is required to produce a particular good, the relative prices equal the ratio of labor time required to produce one unit of output of two goods. Now, for a moment, just focus on this term ALC. What does this mean? Suppose I require 10 hours of my time to produce one unit of clothing and you require 5 hours to produce one unit of clothing. Now, what this means is relative to you, I am more inefficient or relative to me, you are more efficient in producing goods. So if we want the price of clothing to be lower, what is going to happen in terms of this framework is the person who requires less time to produce a particular good will be more efficient and thus the price will be lower. Now when we look at labor time required to produce one unit of clothing, in a way this is just an inverse of productivity of each worker. So just keep this in mind and this will help us understand this class of models much better. Thank you for